ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another episode of In the Fighting Chair. It's an uh, interview series here for a Living Sharks Museum. Uh, we're located in Westerly, Rhode Island. We are America's first shark history museum. We're very excited to have been able to have uh, a lot of amazing guests on our show uh, over the past few weeks. While everybody's social distancing, uh, this is a good opportunity to get to know some folks at a distance. And today, very excited to present uh, Steve Alton, uh, the well-known author of Meg and many others. We're going to talk about some of his work and some of the things he's working on now. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to bring on Mr. Alton. Hey, Keith, how are you? Good. How are you, Steve? Good. How are you faring during this time period? Well, I sort of live in my office all the time anyway, so I, I wouldn't even know there's a pandemic going on, <laughs> except that we're low on toilet paper. Oh. <laughs> I know the feeling. Well, where are you hailing from these days? I'm in South Florida. Okay. We're in Westerly, Rhode Island. Uh, where were you born? I am Philly born and bred, right, I'm as my Eagles blanket will tell you. Uh, lots of Eagles fans here in, in Westerly, which is kind of an interesting thing because obviously it's it's New England and pretty much everybody's Patriots. But uh, some, something about this little area here, they like the Eagles. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the early days of Mr. Alton uh, and how you became a writer. Uh, were you a writer back in high school? Uh, no, I was a physical education major, as a matter of fact, and, and went to Penn State University to get a degree in uh, uh, physical education and uh, certified in, to in coaching and teaching. And then I went on to the University of Delaware for two more years to get a master's in sports medicine because I was interested in coaching basketball. And so I took it about as far as a slow white Jewish guy could take it. I played a little bit in high school, played a little bit in college at Penn State at a branch campus and went on for a doctorate degree at Temple University, just so I could work with Hall of Fame uh, legendary coach John Cheney. So I learned a lot from Coach Cheney. And so my track was not about journalism or writing. It was really about physical education for a while. Uh, but did you find yourself with an interest in writing during your early years of school? or, or I had a great interest in writing. I had a great interest in reading, and one of the first books I read was Jaws, which I see sitting there in the back someplace. And, oh, of course. But uh, And, of course, that had a lot of influence on my future Meg books. But um, it wasn't until uh, I was 35 years old that I really took up the idea of writing. That, that was because I, I came up with the idea for Meg from a Time Magazine article on the Mariana Trench. And... Um, together with the, the uh, sort of um, reading uh, 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 investigation of Megalodon that I had done back when I was a teenager, sort of linked together the two ideas to create Meg. Now, did Meg start out as a short story or did you know it was gonna be a book right away? No, I knew it was going to be a book. Uh, in August of 95, I read an article about the Mariana Trench, and they talked about hydrothermal vents and, you know, this entire uh, food chain at the bottom of the ocean. And that sort of spurred me on to, to lay out the book, and I did about um, a month's worth of research, and then I started writing the book at night from about uh, 11 o'clock at night to about 3 in the morning and on weekends. It was kind of an interesting time there in the mid '90s, where like we're we're just getting acquainted with the internet, uh, just starting to get social online. Uh, we have access to information at our fingertips, uh, which we take for granted now, of course. Uh, well, there was no actually, internet back then in in '95, and so I did all my research at the library. Yeah. But a short time after that, the internet came on and made. Yeah, not not long after there. <clears throat> so was Meg the first story you ever wrote? Yeah, Meg was the first book. And um, what happened was uh, I basically set a goal to become an author. And because I had a job during the day, the only time I could work with 
on the book was on weekends and, on, and at night when I came home from work. So I'd stay up till about three in the morning and write. And uh, when I had a manuscript together, I looked for a, a literary agent, sent out about 60 different query letters to agents who handled fiction, found one guy who was interested in Los Angeles. He thought that Meg would make a great movie and a book, but it needed a lot of editing, he said. He said, editing is like uh, cutting a fish. You chop off the head, you chop off the tail, and you start with the meat in the middle. And so he offered to help me edit the book and teach me how to edit, uh, but he wanted $6,000. And I don't think we had $600 in the bank at the time. You had to sell your car, is that right? I, yeah, I did. I sold, my dad had bought me a 71 Chevy Malibu convertible when I was 17. I had kept the car in good shape and uh, I was using it as a second car, so it was okay to sell it and use the money to pay for editing fees. And we edited the book together. In a lot of ways, it seems like a lucky break. Uh, did you, I, it's a, it's very easy to kind of look at it from a distance and, and think that it was a, a very lucky process that didn't take very long, but it actually, I'm sure it did. No, uh, it, took, it wasn't a lucky process at that point other than I found the right person to represent me. And how many we rejection on, letters did you get? <laughs> we got, a, I got about, uh, I sent out 65 letters I think I got back about 20 rejection letters and the rest I never heard from. What did, what did you do with those rejection letters? You only need one, you know, thing to stick. And I got the one that managed to stick. So we edited the book together and I took a job as a, as a sales manager of a meat company, which I knew nothing about, but had a strange uh, history with the owner. Uh, and on uh, Friday the 13th in September of 96, I went to work and realized I no longer had a job. At the board of directors that I had unified there, which is a long story, uh, decided that they were working so well together and now they no longer needed me. So I went home, had no money, and our book was about to go out to the market. And my wife was upset. And I said, honey, this is the best thing that could happen. Now I can focus on my second book. And she about threw it a frying pan in my head. But four days later, Meg went out to the six biggest publishing houses in the country. And buoyed by the fact that we had a first look deal with Disney's Hollywood Pictures, um, I was able to sign a two book deal for over seven figures. So I went from the crap house to the penthouse in one phone call. That's incredible. And that started a series of things that, that put me on a, a roller coaster of highs and, and pretty deep lows at the same time. Now, did you have any other connection to Sharks besides the film Jaws? Well, I did, a, you know, Jaws had turned me on to Great White Sharks, so I did a lot of reading about nonfiction stories about Great Whites. And there was always a blurb about Megalodon, usually with uh, the black and white photo taken in the Smithsonian of the, of the Meg Jaw. But nothing commercial had ever really been written about Megalodon. So you know, I wanted to be the first. Did you have any internal fear about sharks or were you just intrigued? Uh, I just, you know, when you see, I remember seeing uh, uh, Blue Water, White Death, and that was a pretty powerful movie with the, the uh, gray white scenes at the end of it. But, um, you know, I like anybody else, I wouldn't want to be swimming with them, but it, there's a fascination. That was way back when people didn't, didn't go in cages with them and and didn't swim out in the open with them. So how did your AOL email end up helping you in the end? My AOL email? <laughs> yeah. So you keep tabs with, with all of your fans. You oh, oh, okay. You've been emailing a long time. Well, it wasn't the email as much as just a uh, commitment that to anyone who ever had emails who has emailed me in the last 25 years, they always get a personal email back from me. And this way it enables me to get close to my fans. I, I use their names as uh, characters in my books. Uh, we have a monthly newsletter comes out. Um, and so, you know, we have, have a very special relationship with the, the fans that have named, they named themselves, <clears throat> excuse me, the Megheads. The Megheads are very, uh, vocal group. Uh, they love sharks. They love Megs. 
And uh, they were probably the uh, silent army that pushed the MiG to such success as a movie two years ago. Absolutely. Um, and, and like you said, there, there weren't many uh, shark related uh, fictional films and material around during that time. Uh, Jaws was kind of the big headstone, uh, both positive and negative aspects of, of shark portrayal. Uh, but of course, you know, the, the Meg fans or the, the real shark fans, uh, especially in the teenage years, always wanted to see more, more gore, more, more shark bites. And that's something you brought in your, in your book. Yeah, that's very true because, you know, I love Jaws. I remember reading Jaws as a 15 year old, but you know, there was not much in the book about the shark itself. You know, this, you know, Peter Benchley was involved in establishing characters and and uh, Hooper and Brody and Brody's wife and having an affair. And I just wanted to read about the shark. So when I wrote Meg, you know, I made sure there's plenty of action on every page. And they translated most of that through to the film. Were you happy with the portrayal, uh, the final outcome? Well, to answer that, you have to look at the history of the movie. Uh, before the book was sold, we had a first option deal with Disney's Hollywood Pictures. And they went through uh, two bad scripts. And then the, the uh, president of Hollywood Pictures was fired. So when, it, when you lose the president of a studio who was the one who signed your project, the incoming next president always cancels those projects that haven't been put into production. Because if they do well, they reflect good on the other guy. And if they do bad, it reflects on him. So we got the rights back. And six years it took us to get it back to another studio with a script that I had written. And we took it to New Line Cinema. And we had Jan Devon attached as the director. And the producers were the guys who did Hellboy. So uh, they brought in another writer who went in a completely different direction with the story. He made it into Moby Dick with a Megalodon. And it was, it was just awful. And uh, after two years of playing around with that, they really, they put the picture back in uh, turnaround and I got the rights back. And at that point I had met a producer named Del Avery mm -hmm. and her forte was raising money. And she believed a lot in this story. So we wrote a brand new story together, a script together. And she took that script out to her invest, private investors around the world. And seven years later, uh, she met up with uh, Gravity Pictures in China and they put up the money for the movie. And she took that to Warner Brothers, which is interesting itself because Warner Brothers had, had, had optioned Deep Blue Sea. And um, they had optioned Deep Blue Sea at the same time as Meg had been optioned by Hollywood Pictures. And they did that because the two studio heads were in a fight with each other. So now Warner Brothers, you know, 20 years later, was being presented to Meg again. And they wanted in, they loved the project and they wanted in. So they bought in for, I think, 25% and put it all together. So, you know, the, the hero of that story is Belle Avery. Uh, she read the book. She had a deal with it. Uh, a movie project that nobody wanted in Hollywood because it had been turned down by two studios already. So, you know, if anyone made it possible, it was Bell Avery. There was a period of time where Eli Roth was even attached to it, right? Yeah, he was attached um, and he was a big Meg fan and I'm sure he would have done an interesting job. It would have been a, probably a little bit bloodier, but um, no, I, I think uh, the crew did a great job. Now, did you, you had to self-study to learn how to adapt your own book as a screenplay? Or did you have uh, yeah. some guidelines to work from? Yeah, before I had started writing the make script, I'd written about four or five other scripts. So, you know, I understood what went into it, but it takes a while to develop. It's a different style of writing, like you said. Have you done anything with those other scripts? Um, I actually have a, a web, um, uh, web page called the, the Steve Alton project.com and all those, all the uh, scripts that I've written over the years that we never did anything with or didn't have a chance to market. 
uh, are all listed there so people can read them. But And there's a lot of good stuff there. In fact, as we speak today, which is April 24th, um, I have a new script that's going out by the same manager who started my career, Ken Atchity. And um, it's more of a sports movie, but it's a really good script. Probably the best script I've written. So fingers crossed on that one. Yeah, definitely. So you're finally getting to bring some of your uh, original training in, into the forefront. Try, I'm, I'm trying to bring back scripts and, and TV shows that I had written over the years that we never marketed because we were always waiting for Meg to hit. And, you know, I just want to introduce them to the world. There's a lot of good stuff there. But I'm giving my fans the first shot at reading it. That's a really cool opportunity. Uh, can you say the website again for the people? Yeah, it's called uh, the Steve Alton Project dot com, all one word. And so every if you join the, the Steve Alton Project, it's like twelve dollars uh, a month. You get to read all the stuff uh, every month. We put up a, a new script that's never been read before, or a manuscript that maybe I haven't finished as well. That's really cool. It's cool to be a part of the process, uh, especially for your fans. Uh, but you're working on something even more interesting now. Uh, I believe you have some announcements to make here pretty soon. You want to talk to us a little bit about Meg Island? Yeah, your show is the first one that we'll actually mention it. We, today, later today, uh, probably by later this evening, we will send out a newsletter to all my fans with the links to um, a teaser and uh, the, the uh, <laughs> um, the, new, the new project is called um, Meg Island and Sea Monster Cove. And what it is, it's a website that's interactive where members get to see uh, the most terrifying creatures ever to have existed in these uh, modern futuristic aquariums. But not only can you see the creatures themselves, but we'll have um, uh, a web series that I'll, I'll be writing and the best special effects we can get and uh, interaction between when you're looking at the animals, they're looking at you and the other people are looking at you too. So you're actually part of the scene. So there's, there's a lot we're offering and we're making the big, the first teaser comes out today. That's so exciting. So it's a cool uh, fan uh, inspired, uh, almost a Jurassic world, if you will, uh, but from your world, from your imagination. Yeah, it's, it's an entirely different Meg universe, but still using the same creatures that were in the series. Uh, completely different story. And it all takes place on a, a real island called Mog Island which is in the Northern Marianas. And the island is about five miles away from the Mariana Trench itself. So we designed an island that could be built today um, from a very real place. And it's got a great backstory, which we're gonna re release in a two-part pilot in the next 30 days. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat's a little scratchy today. <laughs> That's okay, so. Not the uh, virus, though. <laughs> good, good, good. Just, that's what, just that's putting what in, we want to hear. Putting in 18-hour days, seven days a week, is, I'm sort of wiped out. And so the folks can go to megisland.com to learn more about it. Is that where they'll see the teaser? That's where they'll see the teaser. That's where they'll see um, an Indiegogo uh, site where for a dollar they can become a VIP member of uh, the new site coming up and probably will release open up in June. <clears throat> and they'll get uh, notified of other trailers coming out and, and the pilot. Very cool. Well, I look forward to checking that out. Um, if there's anything we can do to help you on that project, of course, let us know. Uh, America's first shark history museum here. If there's anything we can do. Um, Definitely go visit that, megisland.com, and of course, follow him on Facebook and social media, Steve Alton, and the official uh, Steve Alton. 
Um, I wanted to ask you a few questions from the fans. Sure. One of them we kind of already touched on. Uh, are you happy with how things ended up on screen uh, from the book to the film? Um, what are some of the things that ended up being different from the book to the film? Well, the the uh, story is, is about 50% uh, different. Uh, it's got some of the main characters, but um, anyone who is Japanese in the, in the book are now Chinese. Uh, because those are the production partners, so that that's no problem there. Uh, but it's it's a little bit different storyline. Um, but I thought they did a really good job. I really did. I thought Jason Statham was terrific as Jonas, and uh, John Turtle Dub, Turtle Top did a great job directing. So you know the movie did very well. It's very um, they got the shark right, which is important. Not an albino, but uh, it still looked great. Uh, by the way, in the um, Meg Island and Sea Monster Cove, the Megalodons are albino. And they look great on film. They look, the special effects team, our guys are in the UK, um, Steve Clark and his partner, Paul. Um, fantastic job. And, f and for the folks watching uh, that may not, know this, um, uh, why, from your point of view, did you choose to make the shark albino? Well, if you go down to the Mariana Trench, you'll see that most of the creatures are albino. Uh, it's, it's one of the evolution's gifts to uh, survival, uh, that if you're albino, that you attract other prey to you. And um, there's even bioluminescence in there. Uh, not as much with the Meg, but the other creatures down there. So I felt that albino would be pretty cool and it would be scientifically uh, plausible. And what's scarier than a, a 60 foot megalodon is a 60 foot albino megalodon. Yeah. One of the other things that folks don't think too much about when they watch these movies, but actually is scientifically plausible, is the fact that sharks are cartilaginous creatures uh, and uh, some of the white sharks that we are tagging these days uh, with groups like uh, Atlantic White Shark Conservancy and, and OSEARCH, we're learning that these sharks dive to depths of over 3,000 feet, uh, which is a huge feat for our modern sharks. But when you're looking at a shark uh, the size of Meg, uh, people would wonder, well, can, can a shark dive uh, deeper and how, how much deeper to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, which I'm sure is your initial uh, question in your mind when you were writing. Um, probably uh, that cartilaginous skeleton makes them uh, less prone to any issues with decompression. Uh, and we think that those sharks probably could rise from deep depths. Uh, we see other sharks that spend most of their time in deep, deep waters like Greenland sharks uh, that do actually come closer to the surface uh, at night to feed. Uh, so it's, it's very possible. Um, what is your favorite movie? Beside the Meg? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I, I have to think about it. Uh, you know, it's nothing too revealing, but um, I'm sure I can list 10 of them that are my favorites, you know, maybe including the two Godfathers. How about your favorite sci science fiction, uh, science related film? Oh, well, and Jaws is definitely one of the top 10. No doubt. Uh, in the process of of writing, especially your screenwriting process, did you ever utilize any other scripts to help uh, your process? Uh, well, you know, in learning to become uh, trans uh, purring skills from becoming a novelist to a script writer, you know, one of the first exercises is to read a lot of good scripts. So I, I must have read about 40 or 50 scripts that were, you know, were terrific movies that I liked and, and were great scripts. And then, you know, sort of look at what the screenwriter wrote and how they phrase things and how they use different techniques. Because, it, you know, one page of screenplay is actually one movie minute. And so you, you might be reading a script that's only 100 to 110 pages. 
where they have to take uh, all the information and character development from a, a 400 page book and put it into a, a uh, 110 page script. So it's a different style of writing. And of, of course, we, we notice that on IMDb, you're currently credited on Meg 2. Is there anything else you can tell us about that? I didn't realize I was. You are. You're actually listed as a director. I'm listed as a director? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's news to me. That Don't buy stock in that company then. Yes, not. <laughs> but... Um, no, I mean, Meg 2, I think, will, will be a lot darker than Meg, the first Meg was. And for good reason. I mean, you know, one of the, the goals of the first Meg movie was to establish among the public that the shark existed and the characters and stuff. And it was more of a found movie. Uh, the sa same thing with the opening book. I mean, there was a lot of bloody scenes and stuff but on the page versus the screen. The Trench, however, the second book in this series, is a lot darker story. And I think that uh, I've heard nothing but great things about the script uh, from Bell Avery, but uh, they don't allow me to read that stuff. And, and that's one of the, the frustrating things that, that the fact that I'm not being involved in the movie from a, other than the fact that my books are being adapted, which, which is a great thing, of course. Um, and I trust the people that are doing the adaptation. I trust Bell Avery implicitly. So I don't worry about that. But with Meg Island and Sea Monster Cove, it gives me a, a chance to develop an entirely new universe where I am the screenwriter, where we are using, where I am really one of the directors of the project so that I could give the Meg fans the stuff that was in a novel that maybe they didn't fully realize from the movie. So, you know, there's actually um, going to be two different memberships, one for uh, PG-17, or I'm sorry, it's PG-13, and the other for adults, because I don't want to expose the young kids to the, some of the things we're going to expose to, you know, and I, don't, I don't mean nudity or anything like that, you know, there's no F words or anything like that, but but there is going to be some violent attack scenes, so, you know, that's what you're into, you'll, you'll get your, your money's worth. Sounds exciting to me. That brings up a good point, uh, you know, Steve is a writer. Uh, and, you know, he enjoys writing and he wants to keep writing and he's utilizing all the tools at his fingertips to continue to create within his freedom. Uh, so for us fans out there, anything we can do to help those creative juices continue to flow, uh, we, we can do it. And, he, and Steve's providing us with opportunities to do that. Obviously, buying the book. Uh, it's very helpful uh, going to his website and uh, he's got some other options there too. There's some posters, there's uh, the Project Meg Island, of course, uh, which you can become a member of and that helps him continue to create. So please definitely do that. Um, somebody here wants to know if you're best friends with Jason Statham now. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually never met him. Um, I think the world of him. He was my first choice when they were looking at actors. Uh, so I was thrilled to death when they when they offered him the part. And uh, I thought he was terrific as Jonas Taylor. And uh, But um, I never made it out to the set. My daughter did. And so I have a picture of my daughter standing next to Jason Statham. But um, I've never met the man. I hope to one day. You know, I know he's in the premiere, but, you know, things were pretty crowded, hectic then. Do you, do you think uh, or do you know if they are planning on this next film being directly from your second book or if they're pulling from multiple titles? Well, I haven't seen the script and nor will I see the script until the movie's made. But um, from what I hear, they're, they're pulling, you know, it's, it's the inspiration for the movie. They're following the basics of the plot. Um, and the, the two big, there, there's an A, B, uh, an A story and a B story in the trench. The A story uh, involves uh, Angel, which is the pup that was captured at the end of uh, book one, but not the end of the movie, though. So they have to sort of reestablish that, you know, I'm not sure how they're going to do it, but the Meg was pregnant and they have the pup and the pup was raised in an aquarium. And that's the A story. The B story takes place in the Mariana Trench with a, 
a scientific group that are looking to go beyond that. So how much of those two plot lines they follow, I have no control and no way to tell you. But um, I'm sure it'll be good. Uh, a fan, uh, Chris Carter says, uh, gotta say your books are amazing. And for a writer to add fans' names to any of the books that they've written is an absolute honor. That is something that you've done. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And let me just give a shout out to Chris, who uh, I've, I've gotten to know over the years, and he's an amazing uh, jeweler. He makes uh, make teeth and things like that. So, but um, you know, when I wrote the first book, uh, I needed the names of minor characters, and so I maybe picked someone from you know my childhood or teenage years that I knew. With uh, the trench, I ran out of character names, so anyone who had given make a bad review, I killed them off in, in the trench. And, um, but with uh, Primal Waters and all the other books they followed, you know, I still needed a lot of character names. And so I offered it to my, my fans. You know, I put a contest up and they entered their names. And, you know, every book I've got about 50 or 60 names of characters that are based upon real people and the details of their lives as well. So it enables me to involve my fans in, in my work and, and, and it helps me a lot. That's really awesome. Uh, we've got another fan here, but asking about um, how did you feel about the inevitable comparisons to Jaws when you wrote the first Meg book? Uh, co two completely different animals, two completely different stories. Um, Jaws was a great book, uh, but it was, you know, kept on uh, a boat with three people. You know, it was, it was a different type of storyline. Meg is much more open, you know, it, it takes place in, in um, you know, uh, Japan and moves over to the United States. Uh, you know, it's, it's a much wider range and more people and stuff. So different kind of stories, but, um, you know, there's always going to be that kind of comparison. But I'm a, I'm a Jaws fan. So I take that as a compliment. Sure. Of course, behind you, you have a poster there for The Lock. Uh, any plans for uh, any adaptations there? Well, the same group that did The Meg are doing The Lock, uh, led by Bill Avery. Um, and uh, they were actually supposed to be in production right now. They, they were set to start filming at the end of August, but uh, our president, you know, decided to drop a tariff on China and our Chinese uh, production group, you know, put things on hold. And then with the virus and things like that, we were, we're probably moved back about a year. But so Meg 2 will go into production before the lock. It was the act, actually the opposite for a while. Oh, okay. Um, one of your fans wants to know, uh, what's the status? Um, on the second lock novel i think carol means the third not lock novel the second lock novel was actually vostok which came out a few years ago uh we probably should have titled it the lock to vostok but um you know didn't think of it at the time the third book is the lock heaven's lake which i'm working on um but that has been uh sort of placed on a slower track right now with the virus and you know printers being closed and things like that. Sure. Well, Steve, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day uh, to come and chat with us. Uh, really looking forward to your new projects, uh, especially Meg Island. Uh, really interested in seeing uh, what happens there and how that grows for you. I hope it becomes a huge attraction. Uh, well, the, the first people that are going to get a chance to uh, look at all this stuff are the people who get my newsletter and who follow me on Facebook. So I made I posted an announcement last night. We were trying to get the newsletter out either yesterday or today. It's going to come out today. Uh, we're, we're putting all the links and things together right now. But sometime a little bit uh, later tonight, maybe 5 or 6 o'clock tonight, and I will do a posting and let everyone know. The important thing is if you don't get my newsletter, sign up for it at stevealton.com. And uh, that way you'll get the trailer, you'll get the uh, posters, you'll get everything. 
uh, right down below there, stevealton.com. Sign up for the newsletter, as he said, right there. Um, again, Steve, thank you again. Uh, hopefully, we'll get to have you on again in the future and chat about how things have progressed for you. Thanks no, for thank taking you. the time out today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this was another episode of In the Fighting Chair. A uh, nice casual conversation there with Mr. Steve Alton talking about Meg uh, and the future of Meg uh, and his project, Meg Island. Very cool stuff. Uh, looking forward to seeing you again next week uh, for our next guest. Follow us online on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Living Sharks Museum, and visit livingsharks.org. Uh, my name is Keith. I'm the curator of Living Sharks Museum, and we'll see you all here next time.